decided to take a brief moment. We populated our pews a little bit more than I had um, for an announcement. And I'd like to give that same update for Dan Harrison um, to our group gathered here. So you may have heard Dan Harrison uh, fell on Wednesday and has been in ICU since. Um, he's still in ICU. Uh, some progress has been made, though nothing definitive enough to be made anything official. Um, so Cindy is with Kelsey and Buddy, uh, their kids, and Kelsey's boyfriend, Nick. Um, they're all here within hours. They flew from California and Washington, D.C. Um, so they have a great support system. Um, they would prefer no calls, texts, emails, or meals uh, quite yet. Uh, the meals things will change sometime today, um, probably today. I will be sending out an email and invite people to uh, provide meals for them. We don't know quite how that will work. If we'll have you drop them off with their neighbors. Uh, Big Bader Schneider, you may have heard of uh, my predecessor in this uh, place. Um, so please stay tuned. Please continue to send your prayers. Um, we have been feeling the effects of those prayers. It's been miraculous. So please continue praying. And now back to the Jesus effect. Well, Jesus comes to us, and we don't come to Jesus. There's a lot of rhetoric consuming Christian culture in the world that says maybe the opposite. Sometimes when we listen to the radio or to evangelists or when we hear evangelical preaching, we might hear an opposite message, that we must come to Jesus Christ, that we must choose Jesus, that we must welcome Jesus into our heart. You might hear that your life depends upon turning to God and to Christ. There's a myth floating around that it's our job to choose Christ, that life and love only come through that choice. I'm here to tell you that this is false, or at least out of order. Jesus comes to us first. We do not come to Jesus first. Jesus comes to us. We do not come to Jesus. God always acts first. Today we celebrate Jesus' baptism in the Jordan at the hands of John the Baptist. Some of you may have heard me say this before, but John the Baptist is one of my favorite people in the Bible. Maybe and I, I like to call him J.B. John is kind of an intense guy, a radical. Some might call him a heretic, and some might call him a miracle. But in any case, we probably know him best as baptizer. There's some evidence to suggest that Jesus was John's disciple for much of Jesus' life, but we know for certain that the Gospels, in the Gospels, that it is by John's hand that Jesus is baptized. It is in John's presence that God opens the heavens and speaks a blessing on God's Son. Matthew has already set the stage for John. He's a little wacky, definitely a bit fiery. Remember, this is the guy who called the religious elite i.e. his peers, a brood of vipers. But all the same, we know we are to hear his words as the words of a God-full prophet. He quotes the prophet Isaiah as he calls the crowds to repent and watch for God's kingdom, which he says is coming. And then remembering that our text this morning begins with verse 13, I'd like to share with you what John says in verse 11. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. In other words, though John prophesies for God's kingdom, Jesus, the coming Messiah, is God's kingdom. Everything will change when Christ will come. Do you remember the misconception I was talking about, which our world sometimes holds about God's relationship with us? There's a misconception that we must choose God first, that we must come to Jesus, that we must let Jesus into our hearts, that we must and we are to come to God. This was John's misconception too. Here again, the way this story unfolds. Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered, let it be now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me. Do you hear the world's rhetoric in John's question? Do you hear an assumption? 
John cannot believe that Jesus wants to be baptized by John's hands. Here, John, as he is fully aware of his smallness, fully aware of his limitations and brokenness, fully aware of his unworthiness, wonders why the Christ would come to him to be baptized. Shouldn't, God, shouldn't John go to Jesus for baptism? Shouldn't the broken, the limited, the, the human, the sinful, and the feverish come to the Son of God? Well, it makes sense to me. It seems to have made sense to John. But no, no, we hear something else from Jesus. Jesus responds by saying this, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Even in the depths of despair, in the fever of pain and oppression, in the finitude of frail human body, and in the uncertainty of the human mind and heart, even still, in these burdens of John, Jesus comes for baptism. When we come to church, when we worship along with the radio, when we read the Bible, when we feel the Holy Spirit move in friendship and family, when we taste bread and wine, when we dip our fingers, in the baptismal waters and remember our own baptisms. When we do these things, we do not do them for God's sake. In fact, these are things that God does and provides for our sake. God gifts us with worship, with song, with scripture, with relationship, with sacraments, not so that we might become satisfactory in God's eyes, but rather so that we might know that God has already chosen us. God chooses us. And all of our coming to Jesus, all of our surrendering to Jesus, all of our finding Jesus in our hearts and giving our lives to God's ministry, we do all of this secondarily in response to that which God has first done for us. God acts first, always, and then we respond. God chooses us first, and then we respond. God loves us first, and we respond. It's going to be hard to wrap our hearts and minds around. In a world as competitive as ours, we do not compete for God's love. In a world governed by prerequisites and to-do lists, nothing bars our way to God's love. In a world structured with hierarchy, with corporate and social ladders, we find ourselves all loved equally by God. In a world which separates us into cliques, economic classes, racial divides, sexual and gender divides, God uses baptism as a way to bring us together. John's trepidation is also our trepidation. Are we good enough for God? Surely God will not come to me, for I am unworthy. As John might say, unworthy to even carry his sandals. Surely I must go to God. But this is not the message we hear in baptism. This is not the message we hear in today's scripture. In our baptisms, we hear that we are beloved children of God, with whom God is well pleased. We come to the waters already loved by God, already chosen for God's family, already inheritors of eternal life. We come in response to God first coming to us. We come in response to overwhelming love and grace freely given to us. We come to this place excited to respond to God's generosity in worship, song, praise, and service. Now as we leave this place, our trepidation and worry will go with us. It is hard to overcome feelings of inadequacy, of limitation, of heartache, and guilt. But let us remember Christ's baptism always, and our baptism. Let us remember that Jesus himself, the Christ, the long-awaited Messiah, the Son of God, was baptized by a dirty, feverish, guilt-ridden, pained, and inadequate prophet with low self-esteem. Let us remember that God works wondrous things in us, even when we can't see it ourselves or don't think of ourselves as worthy. God sees you, and God sees your worthiness. As we go from this place burdened by whatever brokenness we need to bear, we go already chosen by God 
already loved by God, 